This is defending the Immaculate. Together, we defend the honor of our Blessed Mother. The Virgin Mary, perfectly united to the will of God. Why would this make her immaculate, free from sin from the first moment of her conception? Why would her being perfectly united to the will of God indicate that she is free from sin? Well, we read in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians that each fallen human is born in a state of opposition to God's holy will. That's what it is to be born as a child of Adam, ordinarily speaking. It means that you are opposed to God's will. That's the state you begin life as, a child of wrath, an enemy of God. And then committing further sin is again disobedience against God's holy will. All sin is disobedience against God. That's what St. John tells us. In the Old Testament, we read about the human heart, the fallen heart of a fallen human, that such a heart is full of evil and that the human heart is deceptive. The fallen human heart is unreliable and deceptive. Even holy baptized people struggle to remain conformed to God's holy will and to resist temptation. St. Paul tells us that, that the Christian life is a struggle. It's a struggle. We're born, each of us fallen, fallen human beings are born in the state of original sin. And so, if Mary is shown to be in complete conformity with God's holy will, it signifies she is free from sin, right? Do so you follow that? That if being fallen, being born in original sin and, and having sin, if a clear indication of that is being opposed to God's holy will, being orientated against God's holy will, if we find in the Virgin Mary that her life is one of perfect conformity to God's holy will, and that there's nothing of this deceptive heart, a heart full of evil, if there's no indication of that, but if rather there are indications to the contrary, then it informs us, it tells us, that we are dealing with someone different here. Let's look at the evidence. There's quite a bit of evidence for this one. First of all, in St. Luke's Holy Gospel, the angel says, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And it's the second part here, the Lord is with you, that I want us to pay attention to, because that's not actually a very common greeting in in scripture at all. It's a very rare greeting. It's a greeting that is sometimes given to prophets. Sometimes it's addressed to the entire people of God, but it's a rare greeting in itself, indicating something special about the individual. And admittedly, some of the individuals in the Old Testament this was said to were sinners. Well, they were all sinners, they were all fallen. But it ind indicates a special a special character of Our Lady already. Second, Our Lady's posture towards the angel. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. That's her posture, handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me. Indicating Our Lady is not rebelling against God's holy will, but she identifies herself as handmaid of the Lord. That's who she is. That's how she self-identifies herself before Almighty God. And this fiat, as we say, this be it done, is one that we see echoed by her throughout the scriptures, indicating her perfect union with the will of God. Again, in the visitation, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, and so the reason I've included this one here is because the greeting of Mary causes Elizabeth to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the baby. That's why I've put the second verse there. The baby also 
And who is it that's doing this? It's our Lord Jesus Christ within the Virgin Mary. But this reality that the greeting of Mary is the perfect instrument of the baby Jesus hidden inside of her, she's a perfect channel of grace. Her heart is showing no obstacle to our Lord Jesus working through her, causing Elizabeth to be filled with the Holy Spirit and the baby within her, showing the perfect union of Our Lady and Almighty God. Something that's something that you can hardly imagine as possible for an individual, a creature filled with sin. Again, that's why Our Lady says in her Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Her soul magnifies him, that's her union, her conformity to the will of God, her perfect love for God that causes her to magnify him continually, magnifies continually the Lord without any stopping. And what about this, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour? Again, you've got to you've got to notice that that Our Lady's saying, "In God, my Savior." And what's the name of Jesus? The name of Jesus means Savior. So it's actually this verse is saying that Our Lady, Spirit or Soul, continually rejoices in the reality of Jesus, her Savior, being inside of her. Again, this perfect union that Our Lady. There's no obstacle, there's no obstacle between the grace of Jesus Christ present inside of her and, and her own soul. There are no sins blocking the communication between God and her. We see again, we see this hinted at also in the twofold repetition. As to Mary, she kept all these things, pondering them in her heart. It's repeated again in Luke's Gospel. His mother kept all these things in her heart. We read that the sinful heart, the sinful heart is at odds with God. It's deceptive. But Our Lady's heart ponders Almighty God and the, and the deeds of her Son. There's nothing here of a heart that is opposing God. There's no indication of that. Later on in Luke's Holy Gospel, we're told after the finding in the temple that our Lord Jesus, he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And how could such obedience of Almighty God, our Lord Jesus Christ, be possible if Our Lady was a sinner? Again, this, this verse also points to the holiness of Saint Joseph as well, doesn't it? This verse could not be here if he had to keep telling Our Lady and Saint Joseph, oh, actually, you, we can't do that, you know, you can't do that. Um, I can't obey you in that one. It doesn't say that, it says, full stop, he was obedient to them. He didn't need to oppose them because they were in perfect conformity with his holy will. So he could obey them in all things because they were united to him. And again, that suggests great things about St. Joseph, but that would be for another video. Again, looking at the union, when the presentation of the baby Jesus in the temple happens, we read, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. I'm including this, again, noting the union of Our Lady's heart, her soul, and that of Our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord on the cross, his side is pierced with the lance, but it also, that sword pierces Our Lady's soul because of her perfect union with him, her sinlessness. It's her sinlessness that brings about this perfect union with the will of God that allows that allows that sword of sorrow to pierce her heart just as it pierces his physically. And again, for the last verse here, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, said to our Lord, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts that you sucked. But he said, 
Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And this text is used at Holy Mass, the Masses of Our Lady, the Masses where we, we think about Our Lady. It's used at, at almost all of them in the Latin Mass. And that's because this verse, far from knocking Our Lady in any way, the Church understands it as bringing a correct understanding of her dignity. Our Lord is saying that Our Lady's immaculate quality, hearing the word of God and keeping it, is what brings her true blessedness, you know, even greater than the physical dignity, the dignity of being the physical mother of the Son of God. An even greater reality about her is that she was so perfectly united to the will of God, that she was sinless, that she is an individual that more than anyone else heard the word of God and kept it. And that's something that, as you'll see in all these verses I've already cited, Our Lady is the individual who heard the word of God and kept it. Because she was so perfectly united to the will of God, the Virgin Mary is the Immaculate. May the Immaculate Virgin Mary intercede for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.